Welcome to the Texas Conflict Coach radio program. If you have ever experienced or engaged in destructive or unresolved conflict, then you know it leads to broken relationships, distrust, and damaging results. Our program will help you manage and resolve conflict effectively with strategies, valuable resources, and support. I am your host, Patty Porter. My guest hosts, Dina Zametta and Stephen Kotev, along with our guest experts, will share our experiences, raise your awareness, and give you food for thought. We will share with you problem-solving strategies, no matter what your situation is, at work with neighbors or friends, family, and business partners. Tune in or join in the conversation every Tuesday evening. Good evening, listeners. Tonight's episode, Tips from the Wedding Lawyer on Preventing and Handling Wedding Conflicts, concludes this month's series covering various wedding disputes experienced by the newly engaged and or married couples that involve the first years of marriage, wedding vendors, family, and friends. Christy Ethelin, the blogger and attorney behind Your Wedding Lawyer, is sharing with us tonight design tips to help engage couples prevent and handle conflicts with wedding vendors. Christy has a background in business disputes and consumer law and loves event planning and weddings. Her mission is to educate and empower engaged couples with legal know-how. Christy has been a California licensed attorney since 2008. She has seen and heard in many wedding and financial media resources, including, and most recently, Slate. Her blog, yourweddinglawyer.com, serves as a resource for engaged couples and newlyweds as they navigate the challenges presented during these time periods. She can speak from experience as she is a newlywed herself. She lives in Los Angeles with her husband and their adorable dog, Scout. Your co-hosts for this evening include myself, Tracy Colbeth King, and Abigail McManus. We invite you to participate in our Twitter feed using hashtag conflict chat. Welcome to the program, Christy. Hi, thank you so much for having me. So, Christy, who can you tell us a little about yourself? Sure. Um, actually, that introduction covers quite a bit of it. Um, but in summary, I'm a California attorney. Um, I'm also a newlywed, and I've mm-hmm. been um, writing on um, my blog for about three to four years. Um, mm-hmm. And it kind of came about because initially I started this just as a service-based website, and um, I did a whole lot of um, client potential client screening and realized mm-hmm. that sometimes it wouldn't make financial sense for a couple to hire an attorney to review a contract or, you know, help them with some kind of conflict. Um, so mm-hmm. I just took that opportunity and just decided to share my the information um, on my blog. Awesome. Love that. That's really great. Thank you for sharing that, Christy. When it comes to newly engaged couples, what are the topics – or issues that they typically experience? Um, well, I see, I, you know, I'm, I, I like to pay a lot of attention to what's going on with um, uh, engaged couples out there in the world. And um, there are a few things I see quite a bit. Um, I would say the first one is really probably the worst. Well, I shouldn't say worst. It's, it, it goes against my golden rule, which is that you should always have a written contract for every single one of your vendors. Um, and I see it time and again um, that a couple doesn't have a written contract for, you know, insert what caterer or, you know, DJ, whomever, and sometimes it comes back, um, unfortunately, and there are some consequences for them in the end. Um, and, in fact, actually, I was just uh, spending this week doing some really fun activity, which was <laughs> I've been reviewing um, wedding insurance policies, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what you guys do in your spare time, but I review yeah. insurance policies. And it was interesting because I saw that one of the requirements, if you have, um, if you want to make a claim for a lost security deposit, you have to have a written contract. So it's not just me. It's also the insurance carriers out there. Like, you really just have to have a written contract. Um, I think another problem I see quite a bit is, you know, maybe not understanding fully um, what the ramifications of a contract are. Um, maybe not fully understanding, you know, all of the um, fine print of a contract. Um, For instance, 
you know, um, sometimes, I mean, I read a lot of uh, wedding contracts too, and sometimes those contracts are like, some of those provisions are so complicated that I, even as a trained attorney, like I have to sit down and really analyze what's put in front of me with like, you know, a whole lot of, um, like gra- I use graphics and stuff to try to, or not graphs, gra- graphs to just sort of figure out mm-hmm. what the conditions are and what happens if one of them is triggered. It can be really complicated language. Um, mm-hmm. You know, and then there's other situations I read all the time. I'm a member of a lot of different um, wedding Facebook groups out there, and I see a lot of um, brides posting that they hired a photographer and the photographer has bailed on them at the last minute, and they're mm-hmm. scrambling to find a um, – like a, a last-minute replacement, and that's, that could be prevented um, with the right kind of provision in the contract. Um, gosh, and I guess another thing I see is not, you know, communicating all of your expectations with your, um, with your wedding vendors. Um, I see this quite a bit with um, wedding photography, excuse me, photography and videographers as well, where, you know, they want to have, you know, maybe like six months to put together your wedding album and maybe you want them to do it in an eight weeks. So sometimes that stuff isn't spelled out. Um, and then another thing, because I've been spending so much time reviewing policies this week, is, you know, couples who don't um, shop around or they don't purchase any wedding insurance, which I'm now an even bigger proponent of this week after reading all those policies. <laughs> so I think mm-hmm. those four things um, I see come up quite a bit. And Could Chris, you elaborate you may- for our listeners a little bit about wedding insurance? I know when I was in the throes of wedding planning and deciding what we needed and what we didn't need to need and what we should cut because of budget limitations, uh, I was trying to wrestle with the idea of do we need wedding insurance? So what would be some of the perks for our listeners to really research and possibly get wedding insurance? Sure. Um, well, overall, it, there's a couple different types of insurance cares, um, coverage you can get. One is, is um, liability insurance. And mostly, I would say, 99% of the venues out there are going to require that you have some kind of liability insurance. And it's okay. going to be there in the event that, um, you know, one of your guests trips and falls and, you know, something happens where there's some kind of property or physical damage to one of your guests or even to yourself. Um, and I know that sounds like there is no possibility in the world. How could someone ever get hurt at a wedding? And, and these things just, they sometimes just happen. Um, uh-huh. There was a case I read a few years ago where this, it wasn't a wedding, but this, um, uh, this woman was invited to a party and she was a little too close to like the cliff um, over like a ravine kind of a thing. And she like fell off the, into the ravine and like twisted her ankle. I, I don't know if it was a ravine. That sounds more dramatic than maybe it was, but, <laughs> she tripped and fell basically um, over the edge of something, and she hurt her ankle. And um, you know, luckily the the owners of the property where they where the party was, they had you know sufficient um, property insurance to cover that, so it, it was probably okay. fine. Um, you know, things just happen. I was also reading the other day about this couple that was at a park and an oak tree just decided it wasn't going to live anymore and literally its branches started falling off and hit this poor guy in oh the head. Right. These wow. things just happened. Yeah, it's crazy, right? He's, he's, he had, like, um, a cut and he had to get stitches, but he, you know, was injured. And so liability can come in and kind of handle that kind of issues just for the event. Usually it's like a 24 to 48-hour period where you mm-hmm. and whoever's hosting the event are going to be covered. Um, and then there's other types of insurance that are, are you know, unique to events, um, such as, um, um, uh, gosh, why am I blanking right now? The one I was just talking about where you have a lost deposit. So let's say that you um, buy a beautiful wedding dress and you put down, you know, a couple of thousand dollars for a deposit, and three months later the um, – the wedding store closes and you can no longer get your dress and they've also walked off with your deposit. Um, Something like a lost security deposit provision is going to come in to cover that cost, which is great. Actually, that's Mm -hmm. one of my more favorite provisions that you can get. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, And then there are things that can cover, you know, damage to 
your special attire, like your dress or your, you know, a, a groomsman tuxedo, like something that happens to a more expensive special item of uh, clothing. Um, mm-hmm. There's also, I don't know why I'm blanking right now. <laughs> there's, there's a lot out there, and I think it's definitely worth looking into. Oh, and of course, there's also cancellation insurance. Um, mm-hmm. And that's in the event of like, you know, like unpredictable weather happens and you've, you've luckily bought your insurance in time. Because usually they have like a buffer where you have to buy it within a certain number of days um, before the wedding. Let's say you're inside mm-hmm. that time period and there's a snowstorm and no one can get to your wedding. Um, it's designed for that kind of, um, that kind of event. And, Christy, um, earlier you had also mentioned about contracts, and you said people that one of the biggest issues with contracts is people don't get one. Do you, know, mm-hmm. do you find that people who aren't getting contracts, are the contracts are with, like, their family and friends who are acting as vendors, or is it with actual, like, wedding industry, like, people that are in the industry? I think it's both. I think when you have a family member who's offered to – like I did my sister's wedding when she got married, I did her flowers for her wedding. Um, mm-hmm. It wouldn't have been necessary for us to have a contract, right? I'm her sister. <laughs> yeah. Right? But, I mean, maybe everyone's family is different, but I did it for free. I volunteered to do it. Um, but if you're dealing with it, it was, there are times, though, where I've seen situations, even in my own wedding planning, where um, there, I, everybody kind of wanted to work on, like, the honor code. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh-huh. Very noble, right? But... Mm-hmm. And there's, that's a wonderful thing, and I'm not saying you should distrust people, but, you know, there are um, sometimes areas of communication that a contract will cover for you that you won't even think to have in a discussion. Yeah. Huh. So it almost that's, seems like the contract is – Exactly. I agree that it's really interesting because it almost seems like the contract serves as that piece of document that helps you have a conversation to plan for your right. wedding. Mm -hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Because you can go through, I mean, as, you know, I love a checklist. I mean, I love that because Mm -hmm. it reminds me of, like, the topics that need to be, you know, discussed and whatever with anything. I mean, I love a checklist so much I made one up for, like, our family picnic from two weeks ago. (laughs) You know, Mm -hmm. I just, you know, Mm -hmm. I like great work Mm -hmm. again. Um, So it can kind of, like, lubricate, lubricate the conversation, you know, where you know to discuss, okay, timelines or, um, if you have, like, a caterer coming, like, when they need to be there, which might not come up naturally in a conversation, but if it's in front of you in a checklist, it will, or in a form of a contract, it will. Right. Absolutely. Thank it's you so much. It's interesting because I, I, I think it's interesting, ahead, too, because I think a, a, con, a contract almost seems like something that would be common sense that people would get, and I, I think it's very surprising if you find out that people don't get contracts or that the vendors mm-hmm. don't often, because you would think the vendors would take it as they should. They should get one too, just because they don't want to have a bride cancel on them, or something for holding a date. So it's interesting to hear that it works more on the vendor side and not vendors looking out for themselves as well. Yeah, I think you know everyone. I, you know, I I think a lot of um, wedding vendors are really creative and they're very collaborative, right? And that's mm-hmm. great. I love that. Um, but. Mm-hmm. Along that same line of thinking, they may not always be thinking um, about having a contract in place. I think most of them do. Mm-hmm. I'm usually surprised when I hear about someone not having a written contract, but, it, it, you know, it does happen. And even in my own wedding, mm-hmm. I think I drafted, like, four contracts. <laughs> for <my laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. <laughs> we had a similar experience for our, when we were planning our wedding is we had a jazz trio who we actually found because there was a restaurant that we really liked to go to. And so they always played um, for Sunday brunch. So when we went there one Sunday, we said, hey, we really like you. We come here every Sunday. It would be really great if you played at our wedding. And they're like, absolutely. But when it came to uh, having contracts and things along those lines, they were so laid back that they didn't even think they needed one. So I ended up just Mm -hmm. creating something in Word and we all signed mm-hmm. it, and everything was fine, and they did what they needed to do, and they were used to doing shows, but they just weren't used to the whole concept of having something documented. Right, and I, I think mm-hmm. it has a lot to do with the like, creativity and collaboration vibe that most um, 
wedding uh, professionals have, which is a beautiful mm-hmm. thing, <laughs> you know? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I just want to remind listeners that you are listening to the Texas Conflict Coach Blog Talk Radio Program, and we are chatting with Christy Aslin, author of the Wedding Lawyer Blog, A Guide Before, During, and After Your Big Day. Tonight's program focuses on the top issues couples newly engaged experience with their wedding vendors. It could be videographer, the venue, photographer, and how to resolve them in a constructive way. And so, Christy, we just talked about some of the top issues that uh, newly engaged couples might find themselves in dealing with what, when planning their wedding. So I was wondering, what are some tools and strategies our listeners can use to avoid conflict with their wedding vendors? Sure. I think, um, you know, you want to pick the right vendors to work with, the right wedding, right wedding professionals um, to, to work with on your big day. Um, and I, I think part of that is doing some really good research um, you want to make sure that you are seeing all of the reviews that are out there on social media, like Yelp. Um, there's also some really wonderful Facebook groups out there for um, <clears throat> um, engaged couples. Um, they're usually mm-hmm. called like Recycle Your Wedding, and they're, they're specific to um, particular cities. So you can go on there and you can even say, has anyone met with so-and-so? And I bet you'll probably get a response. Um, so checking for reviews, and then um, also asking for references um, can be really, really helpful. You want to ask for a couple of them, obviously. It's, you know, it's not really that dissimilar from interviewing for a job, right, where um, you, you know, the wedding professional should come prepared to give you, um, you know, a couple of people they've worked with in the past. And then I, I suggest instead of, you know, if you can avoid um, or if you're able to have a phone conversation or even meet in person with those people, that that's a better way to go than over email. Um, you know, actually, when I was um, shopping around for wedding photographers, I um, met with the person we eventually hired, and she had three really great references, and I just felt so comfortable knowing that she'd worked so well with people in the past. Um, and now I'm one of those people she, you know, I, I volunteer to be a reference for her, too, because she's just great. So it'll give you a sort of peace of mind and confidence mm-hmm. with, who you're, with who you're picking. And then I also suggest that um, when you, unless you have a direct reference, if you pick someone from, you know, Google or whatever, however you find your, your wedding vendors, that you meet with them in person um, because you, you will event, you will certainly get some kind of like first impression of the person um, if you meet with them in person as opposed to even over the phone or, um, <clears throat> excuse me, over email. Um, and then when you meet with them, if you meet with a wedding photographer, um, you want to ask for um, the, um, like a, a portfolio of an entire wedding because sometimes they'll just give you pieces of their best work, which is you know, understandable, but, you know, you can really get a sense for the person's style and, like, their skill level if you see one wedding from start to finish. And then, um, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. <laughs> oh, no, you're fine. I was just going to say I love that. I, I think it's awesome that I that suggestion of asking for the whole portfolio because so many times um, wedding uh, photographers just give you one picture from each of the weddings that they've been, they've photographed or they'll tell you to go online and look at their gallery and you only see one picture. So the idea of looking at one wedding like the entire way through I think is an awesome, awesome suggest- suggestion. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because it gives you a full picture of what their style is mm-hmm. too. Um, and then you just want to make sure that you also sit down with them and you review the contract um, and make sure that you ask good questions um, and make sure that you, you know, understand the contract to the best of your ability um, and make sure that whatever you want is in there. Like if you have a um, – if there's something really really important to you, like if you want there to be doves released at the moment you say, I do, make sure that when you work with your wedding planner that you spell that out. Um, I've reviewed quite a few of these, like, um, of these contracts over the years, and sometimes they're, like, incredibly vague – so if there's something really, really specific that's important to you, make sure you put it in there. Mm. Oh, I'm sorry. One more thing about that um, is when you work with your photographer and videographer, and I, I mentioned this a few minutes ago, 
um, sometimes, you know, you'll have a different expectation in terms of when you want to get the finished product versus what they think is reasonable for handing over the finished product. So um, make sure that you have a conversation about that and that you put it into your contract. That's actually a really great point. Another thing that I've also noticed is some photographers will include a bundle, so they may offer engagement photos prior to your wedding, and I find that mm-hmm. sometimes that's helpful for brides because they can go through the engagement photos, look at them, and see the photographer style on them, really. It's kind of like you're trying it on to see if that's really what you want for your big day. So that's one of the mm. things that I've also noticed here, too, is that engagement photos are somehow being incorporated into packages so you can kind of have a sneak peek and say, you know, is this what I want for my wedding? And if it's not, how can I work with the photographer to get what I want for that special day? I think that's great because you'll also get a sense of the person's person, the photographer's personality and vice versa. I mean, I'm a little bit <laughs> uncomfortable in front of a camera, um, but if someone, if I know someone a little better too, uh, it helps because they know how to work with me and vice versa. Mhm. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I mean, I think it's important too with photographers. Um, they, like you said, Mitch, if there's something specific you want, I think it's also important to make sure that you mention stuff you don't want to. Because I know there's certain mm-hmm. photos now, especially with Pinterest, that people get in their mind that they want, and they will go on and they like they'll prefer dipping pictures over lifting up pictures or the jumping picture. And some I remember when I met with my photographer, she was specific like, are there stuff that you want, and then what is the stuff you don't want? And I think it's important that you mention that too. So you don't because mm-hmm. I think if you're doing a pose you don't really like you're going to feel even more uncomfortable. So mm-hmm. I think that's also also good. Absolutely. Yeah, I agree. That's a really great point. Really great point. Yeah. If you find someone who finds themselves in a vendor dispute and the strategies we previously discussed were not successful, what should they try next, Christy? Um, okay, so the first step should be you want to write um, some kind of demand letter. So you don't want to rush to file a lawsuit or rush to file some kind of like small claims action. Um, You initially want to have some kind of conversation, hopefully with some kind of letter setting forth what had happened, Um, because you sort of want to hear their end of the story too. I, I know that sometimes these things get very tense, and believe it or not, this actually happened to me after my wedding. Uh, one of our, our, vend- our caterer actually um, didn't do what he told us he was going to do, um, and I was really angry. <laughs> but I, <laughs> when I got back from our little – we took a little mini moon after our wedding. When I got back from it, I kind of took a breath and had a couple of conversations with him, um, you know, and I think that was much more productive than just, you know, hitting him with a bad Yelp review and – you know, yelling at them over, you know, social media um, or filing a lawsuit or something. So you just kind of want to approach your vendor and try to have kind of like a learning conversation in terms of what happened on their end of things. And just be sure when you approach them that you are using um, language that is going to put them at ease instead of um, making them defensive. So you want to use some like non-blaming language. You know, my, my mother-in-law, like her, her, the best phrase I ever hear use is, when she has a conflict with someone, and I bet she did this, did this with this particular caterer at her wedding, she'll say, help me understand, and then fill in the blank, whatever it is, that issue during mm. that conversation. And mm. it, I, it really kind of puts them at ease because they feel like you're listening because you should be because you don't know what happened. Mm-hmm. And um, they, it gives them a chance to explain their side of the story. And I think it will actually open them up a bit more to listening to your side of the story too because they'll feel a little more relaxed. And then – Try to, you know, listen to what they have to say. Um, if you get the sense that the conversation is going nowhere or that things are getting so tense that emotions are starting to flare, then um, you should maybe consider exiting the conversation. And, you know, this is another really good thing that I, I can't even take credit for, but I, I heard this somewhere where instead of, um, you know, hanging up the phone on them, you say something like, well, let me think about that and I'll get back to you and then end the conversation that way. It's pretty peaceful and amicable. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, it 
it also puts them at ease in terms of they understand that you might be thinking about it. And don't say it sarcastically either because that will be tempting. <laughs> you know, try to just make it clear that you have the intention of trying to work it out with them if you do. If you feel like it's not ever going to work, then obviously it is what it is and you might have to take a next step. Um, but if you're trying to, you know, work things out informally, then that kind of language can be really helpful too. So it's almost like when you are getting ready to have this difficult conversation with one of your wedding vendors, you really need to do some prep work. You need to think about how you're going to approach them, what type of language you want to use so it's not confrontational. It's more Mm -hmm. of a way of understanding exactly what happened and if you can get some clarity regarding how you can move forward based on the experience that was had. Right. Mm-hmm. And even if you mm-hmm. don't, aren't, even if things aren't completely settled after conversation number one, maybe you have conversation number two or three, depending on how much you want to invest, right? And I, I do think it's important to be prepared, which is why I, um, you know, lawyers typically will write up a demand letter setting out all the facts. So you can be, you know, kind of prepared to have discussed those facts, and the other side can be kind of unnoticed about what happened from your perspective. That's why the letter mm-hmm. kind of works well for lawyers. Mm. I can see I that. That, that makes sense. Yeah, and I, and I really like to help me understand because I like that way of phrasing that because that would definitely make someone less defensive and more likely to um, come at you and provide you more helpful responses because if you come at them blaming them or pointing at them, um, I think that definitely they, they, you'll want to get defensive or they'll get defensive. So it, I like to help, help me understand. Yeah, like me that. too. It works on me when she uses on me. <laughs> <laughs> what we like to do on the program is do a three-part closing. And we like to leave listeners with an assignment for the week or a call to action since we've had this robust conversation on how newly engaged couples can go about the wedding planning process and some of the tools and strategies. What assignment do you want to give them so they can move forward in their wedding planning? Um, There was something I wrote about. It was my most recent blog post. And I was inspired to write it because I see a lot of um, couples – who are constantly, they're like reaching out for answers, meaning that they have a question about, you know, how many bridesmaids should I have? Um, You know, should I get married outside or inside? Should I have my parents walk me down the aisle? Should I not have anyone walking down the aisle? These, These kind of like loaded sometimes like questions about what they want they're wanting to look like. And, you know, I see them looking out to other people and I feel like, truly, like, for most of those questions, it's really about how they envision their wedding themselves, and everyone's wedding is going to be unique to them, um, and the answer is not going to be on Pinterest or on a Facebook group, so I got kind of inspired to um, write up a post about what it's a peak experience exercise, um, and it's basically, it's in some, you tap into a memory that you have from the past, which was really, really meaningful and rich and happy and exciting, and um, you experience it, and it hopefully will um, kind of guide you in the direction of, like, what you want your wedding to be, uh, what do you want it to look like. So basically what you want to do is you want to think about a time in your life when you were really, really happy. And this could be, you know, a time when um, you saw a beautiful sunset or maybe the moment your child was born or maybe, this, you know, the moment you met your fiancé for the first time. And you kind of close your eyes and take a breath, and you think about that moment, and you really kind of feel it. And you need to be, you should be aware of, like, all your senses. So, you know, what are you seeing? What are you feeling? What are you smelling? Is there, like, a rose bush by you? Like, you just kind of, like, delve into that memory really, really deeply. And then you sit with it for a few moments, which is kind of fun because it's a happy memory. It'll make you happy. Mm -hmm. And then um, when you have that memory kind of like good and in your head and in your heart, you grab a pen and you start answering some of the questions related to like what you want your wedding to look like while holding on to that memory and the feelings you have, you know, while you're in the process of remembering it. And um, so that could be like you're walking down the aisle and picturing like where you are and what you're wearing and who you see there and how do you feel and what kind of sounds do you hear? Are you, are you outside? Are you inside? Is there, what song is playing? You know, do you hear 
the ocean in the background. You hear birds buzzing around, that kind of thing. And then, you know, just kind of like walk through the process, process of your ceremony or your reception and kind of get a sense for what you truly uniquely envision for your wedding. Mm. I love that. That is a really great exercise. Yeah. Absolutely. I wish I had that exercise when I was thinking about my (laughs) wedding and in the midst of planning. I love how you are drawing from yourself, right? You're going back Mm -hmm. into your own memories instead of looking on the outside and being overwhelmed. You're really just honing in on you as a human and also you as a couple to really create what your day is going to look like, and I think that's fantastic. Thank Absolutely. you. And I hope everyone enjoys it. And, and yeah, and I I knew so many people, like when I was planning my wedding, I was like the first one in my group of friends, and everybody was like, I have no idea how to do this. I wouldn't even know where to begin. I don't know what I would want. So that would be such an awesome experience just for any, not just the people I know, but anybody. That I think that's awesome. Um, yeah, Christy, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead. <laughs> I just say there, there's so many like traditional notions about what a, what a wedding should look like, and maybe that's not what you want. So this will hopefully give people some like direction in terms of planning. Oh, absolutely. So where can our listeners find you, Christy? Oh, so um, I am all over the place. <laughs> My <laughs> website is yourweddinglawyer.com. Um, you can reach me over email at Christy at yourweddinglawyer.com. Um, it's C H R I S T I E at yourweddinglawyer.com. I'm on Instagram probably the most often at Wedding Lawyer. I'm also on Twitter at C M A E S Q. And I'm on Facebook um, at facebook.com backslash C M A E S Q. Awesome. So, at we end our program tonight, Christy, what final message do you want to leave our listeners tonight? Um, I think that when you're planning your wedding, it should really be all about preparation and preparedness. And if you want, like, the dream, you know, the wedding of your dreams, you need to sort of plan for it. Um, And I consider my blog to be kind of, and my message to be kind of like a very realistic and modern take on wedding planning. And I just am here to hope hopefully help people kind of achieve their dream weddings, um, no matter what that is. Thank you for listening to the Texas Conflict Coach. We hope you enjoyed the program. You can find all of our podcasts archived to listen at your convenience at texasconflictcoach.com or download the podcast at iTunes or Stitcher Radio. You can also become a Facebook fan of Conflict Connections or Twitter me at TX Conflict Coach.